All right. So I hope that was a blessing to everyone. I know it kind of got quiet out there, but I think some of the things I said really kind of cut in and maybe you started seeing some things in yourself that needed to be seen. So I hope that was a blessing. This is the afterburn. If you have a comment or question, you can come on up to the mic. If you're online, our Shamish team will take down your questions and we'll go ahead and see what we can do to address those. Brian. Shabbat Shalom and thank you very much for this teaching. You're um, welcome. This was awesome. I have so much to praise the Father for over the past couple of, every day, but especially over the past couple of days because last night I had probably one of the best just prayer times with the Father last night. I was really seeking Him. I was like, Father, I just, I need more from you. I, I, I want to seek you more. I want to know exactly what I need to do to really rededicate myself and not just show you, but to show myself that I'm doing this right and I'm seeking you. And um, the first thing I wanted to say, whenever you were talking about the different characteristics that you know come to a sum of eight and represent the candles, it made me think about, but what do we light first? We light the servant candle. So would you say that first be a servant, the other things kind of follow that? Would that okay. make sense? Okay, that would, that would be one way you could look at it, obviously. But you know what else you could look at? If you don't have the light of Yeshua lit first, and that thing shining, then that can't light the other eight things. That's awesome. But um, when I was, I'll try to keep this short. When I was praying to the Father um, regarding, you know, I was like, Father, I want to be able to obtain your wisdom, to be able to, to have your discernment in those things. And for whatever reason, he brought up my favorite verse in Scripture, which I've shared before. It's Proverbs 12, 1, talking about um, reproof and those who, who buck reproof and correct discipline, you know, are stupid and things like that. And I was really pondering that and how powerful it was. And for whatever reason, I feel like he really inspired me to go back through the Proverbs. And I went through six chapters last night, and it was, so, it was just so impactful because so much of what is said in those verses is just directly related to what I was feeling and what I was asking for. And as I'm reading this, I've read through the Proverbs before, but it was like the words were bouncing off the page. It was so intimate that it felt like I was literally sitting there with my father and he was instructing me. And I wanted to share uh, Proverbs 2, 1 through 5 real quick. My son, if you accept my words and treasure up my commands with you so that you make your ear attend to wisdom, incline your heart to understanding, for if you cry for discernment, lift up your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasures, then you would understand the fear of Yahweh and find the knowledge of Elohim. He took me exactly to the one verse that could sum everything up, searching for him, the wisdom, the discernment, and everything that follows. And it made me think about when we're going through trials and especially, you know, whenever I was sick and things like that, I found myself complaining a lot. And when I read through these words, and it's like every sentence that Abba, that he, I believe he inspired Shalomo to share with us, it's like every time he says something like that, like, it's like he's saying, I love you, every single time, because he wants you to esteem him, he wants you to accept reproof and find wisdom and grow to a ripe old age and be grateful for the path that he puts you on. And um, it just meant so much to me last night. It made me think about being in the military. When you sign the dotted line, you're owned by the government. I remember doing 11 mile runs and hundreds of push-ups and sit-ups and we would sing ditties and cadences. And we did this one that was something like, you're counting off repetitions, right? So it's like one, two, three, and before you get to four, everybody chants, this is what you asked for. Right. And Esther and I were having that discussion. It's like, man, what if, I, what if we could have that, that discernment to say something horrible just happened for me? I signed on the dotted line to covenant with the creator of all things who openly says, you're going to go through hard times. But instead of being like, man, why did this happen to me? Having the wisdom and the discernment and the shalom to be able to, to just look up and smile and say, Father, this is what I asked for, thank you, because one way or another, I'm gonna find the lesson in that, and I'm gonna use it to grow and to honor you. So I'm just very grateful for this teaching in the past couple of days, it's meant a lot to me as far as rededication, and uh, 
Thank you and praise Abba. Amen. Thank you for sharing the comment. Appreciate it. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Thanks for having service. That was quite a thing, the cancellation and then the, the, uh, the putting back on. Um, I struggle a lot during the week with time. And uh, being on time to certain things is one of the more stressful parts of my life. And then even more so brought on by the fact that, um, so I have to start thinking about being on time like the night before or even a day before I need to be, like if I have a job interview, like this last week I had a job interview at, um, he said like 8 or 8.30 on Monday morning, which is pretty early in the morning for a shop manager. Um, the, the man set the appointment up himself. I'm there five, 10 minutes early. I sit there for 20 minutes before having stressed out about it all night long, not sleep well, there before I was supposed to be, like Shabbat for me just has to be different. Like I understand the need to start live stream at exactly, but a first century Hebrew, how do they keep time to such a, a exacting, stressful moment of, you know, it just seems like it's, I understand how some people can be on time and it's not, it's not a Craig, stressful Craig, thing. Craig, Craig, hold on. We start at one o'clock. I know. So I don't understand this at all. What is stressful about being on time at one in the afternoon? I understand stress trying to get to someplace eight o'clock in the morning. Yeah. So well, why, it, what's it, the challenge being it, here? After, no, and after a week, and we're not always on time. I'm just saying that as far as like being dedicated or, or not so so worldly, like to me, like like time is is a is a we can ease the burden on ourselves a little bit on Shabbat by being more accepting with people that are late. I disagree. Okay. Because right. I'm, I'm late a lot. And I know. Okay. So, but there are a lot of people that are sure. late a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay? And that instruction I gave was for all of you. To be on time is part of what's expected. Mm -hmm. That's respectful. And you can tell time even better than they could back in those days. Well, that's my point. First century, a first century Hebrew would be here at on the moment, like... They, they would not be late for services. He, I, okay. I just don't... All right? But you don't have that challenge. You have, you know, phones, clocks, watches. Mm, sure. So this, you can tell time. No, sure. It's okay. just, it's a, it is a stressful... It shouldn't be stressful. It's one in the afternoon. Well, it's, it's not, but to hear you talk about it brings on stress for me. That's something you probably have to work on. Well, it's not that... Not that easy. It's one of those can't things for a lot of people. It just can't. Like it's well, and you guys need to fix it. I'm well, not changing that. Sure, and that's okay. We're not <laughs> late that often as a family. It's well, just, I wasn't thinking of you specifically. Okay, I was thinking that there's a, there's a problem generally with you know about 10 percent of the people showing up late to anything we do. Sure. Okay, which is if we have 200 people show, it's 20 25 people showing mm -hmm. up late. And it's not always the same people, but often enough it is. Sure. And I just wanted to encourage people to fix that. Well, I certainly have compassion on them. I, I feel like we, like I understand why people can be late. But the, the dedication part too, there's levels to, to dedication. And um, to be um, thought of as in areas where like uh, Sodom and Gomorrah were dedicated um, to, to Yah, like they'll never have another purpose. Um, a lot of times we think of that, and I think a lot of what you were trying to talk about this teaching was that a lot of times we think about dedication as being the, the light or the, the sh maybe a, a shining example, but a lot of times dedicated to Yah isn't, isn't what we would think of. It could be the, the, the multitude that were, that were smote in the desert or small areas where um, leadership or uh, kings or something were doing wrong and a plague was brought on the, on the people. Like those people that died could also be considered dedicated to, to Yah as well. Um, and even maybe Sodom and the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Like no, not, I'm, not, I'm not following no. you on this. and I don't agree. I don't know what you, I, you know. That's not the message that I gave today about what I was talking about with being dedicated. So I don't know, have any idea where you're going with that. Okay. okay.
Pete. Rabbi, when you talked about not being surprised, um, I, I had to bring up the fact that I was, I was on the way back to, to Georgia. I was in Georgia, actually, talking to my wife, and I told her, I'm going to lose this signal. I'm going to lose the signal. I'll just call you when I get closer. And sure enough, the phone, the call dropped out. I didn't have any service at all with Verizon. And 30 seconds later, you called me. Now, there's no reason in the world I, that call should have gone through at all. But of course, the call from you got through telling me that the service was on. Could I turn around? Did that <laughs> surprise you at all? No. Of course not. No. Okay. <laughs> so, but, but you know, that's, that's just one of those things. Y'all finds a way. You know, and, and so I, I, I will ne I'll never forget that, that you got through when, when nobody else could have. I want to go back to Second Peter uh, 1, and I think that the picture you had of each one of those candles uh, representing a quality there um, really stuck with me. But, but you stopped short of verse 9, which I think really brings it all home. And he's talking about those eight things. For he in whom these are not present is blind, being short-sighted and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his old sins. I think that fits perfectly with the rededication and the Hanukkah and, and the, the meaning of each one of those lights, particularly with the cleansing. I, I think that, that, that brings it all home perfectly. Yeah. Well, actually, originally I was going to verse 13. I just stopped because I looked at the clock. My notes had me going all the way for, through verse 13, um, which included me getting to the verse 12 where it says it's my, my role to intend to remind people of these things again and again. So I actually would have gotten to it, but I ran out of time. But yes, a good point, because that's why I, went, I had planned to go that far. And early on, as you were talking about dedication and giving definitions of it, I, I found it's, it's indistinguishable from being set apart. No, that, this actually almost could have been a part of the set apart teaching. I realized that as I was putting it together that this whole idea is integral to that whole idea of being set apart. Because if you're set apart, then you have to be dedicated to being set apart and committed to being set apart. Okay? All right, Ashley. Um, thank you, Rabbi, for having this teaching. Um, and once again, I was reminded always be ready for the wedding, because you decided to do a switch through. I, we were just about to get the kids undressed, you know, get them in more clothing that's not gonna tear around the house, and Agnes kept going, no, I'm gonna go see Rabbi today. No, I'm gonna go see Rabbi today. I'm like, Agnes, I love you, I'm sorry, baby girl, we're not gonna go see Rabbi today. And then she saw you when we were driving, and I'm like, I guess we're gonna go see Rabbi today. <laughs> so, um, but I say that because it brought another, like, don't just get don't just put thing, something to the side um, because then Yahweh always has another plan. And so I just wanted to share that and say thank you. Um, earlier when you mentioned or asked us if we wanted Mama Bird to drop the worm in our mouth, um, most people probably said no, but to be honest with you, I said yes. Um, and only because um, I want the, I, I said no the worm as a Torah. Yes, I want that dropped in my mouth. But also, I want to be able to take what I need and then be able to fly the coop one day and make you proud and be able to go, all right, I got the Torah. I understand it. My wings can go. And um, I, I know it's probably a different spin, but that's what I thought of it, because I can't get to somewhere else if it wasn't for you giving Abba's message. So I just wanted to say thank you for that. Um, and um, always never how do I put it, to rededicate myself and to always be with Yah and always to be in him. I'm trying to stay not just on Shabbat, but all the time, stay with him and changing myself fast and hard just to be able to get to the kingdom because it's not acceptable where I've been even shortly ago. And I just want to get there. And I just wanted to say um, thank you for making the announcement. And for the first time in a very long time, I can't wait until Shabbat ends. Because Pesach's coming. There you go. Awesome. And I'll be first. <laughs> you hear that, Elder? She's already filling out her paperwork. All right. Janet? Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you so much for this teaching. That was really, really good. It's just amazing how uh, this is something that Abba has been working on. Me, and then you come, and you say all the things that I need to work on, and that's really cool. 
Um, when you were going through the five different areas on how we're supposed to, um, how does dedication look like? And you went through spiritual, physical, all that stuff. I was thinking about the fruits of the spirits. Is that under relationally or under um, um, relationship with him? Meaning, is it horizontal or is it vertical or both? I'm sorry, which part the of that? Fruits, fruit, the, the fruits. Fruit, the fruits no, of the, the spirit. The fruit of the spirit yes. is... is an exemplification of a vertical that you exemplify horizontally. Okay, you're living with love and joy and peace and the way you treat people with patience and kindness and goodness, etc. That's something that, but it's because of your vertical relationship that we flow that out. Okay. So it's okay? actually both. Okay, and then my question was about, um, okay, so you were talking about initially when you started, you started talking about uh, commitment, right? commitment and how to be dedicated and it's something that you do exclusive, you know, all that stuff that you said. So I was thinking about marriage and you did mention it. So my question to you is for those of us who are married, right? The, ma the covenant of marriage, is that our one of the opportunities, the big opportunities that Abba gives us to really learn how to be devoted exclusively to somebody, committed, willing to work on the areas that we fail in our relationship with loyalty, integrity, trust, and all this stuff. But you, you agree that that's one way that we can use to get in the mindset to get to the kingdom. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. But just let's be clear, because a lot of people are really in some bad marriages and struggling in their marriages. Yes, marriage is supposed to be one of the greatest practice arenas to develop dedication and commitment and all those things. Of course, that's if you actually understood all those things before you got married. Trying to bring them into place if they're not there in a marriage can be done, it can be really hard. So just understand that I don't want husbands and wives going after this teaching and going, see, you need to be more dedicated and committed to this marriage. No, because look, that may be true that you need to, but if you have this problem, you each have to come to figure out that yourselves and fix it yourselves. Because when you got married, if you would understand, if you had understood then what it meant to be dedicated and committed to the union of marriage and to each other, I mean, I don't know what's going on in any of your heads when you're getting married. I can barely remember what was in my head when I got married, okay? Was I thinking about this, that, or the other thing? Or was I just thinking, I like her, I want to be with her and spend more time with her and all that other stuff? I mean, I don't know what I was actually expecting. I didn't, we just got married. We didn't have kids right away. We didn't have all the, I mean, we just were going to start a life together, whatever that meant. I didn't have any really extensive counseling about it and instruction, instruction about it. And so I don't know that I was thinking necessarily a whole I just assumed we'd be happy forever and happily ever after thing. Like everybody assumes until it goes bad. But that's what you assume. But it doesn't always go that way. As a matter of fact, it never goes that way. There's always bumps and hiccups, even if it's a good marriage, right? But did you know and understand when you started what you were doing was a thing called a commitment that was going to require a level of dedication to that? And by the way, it won't work if only one of you does that. You both have to. Because some people are like, yeah, I was very dedicated, but she wasn't or he wasn't. And that didn't work very well. Because then next thing you know, they're cheating and this and that or whatever they're doing because they were not dedicated. And they were not committed. And committed means you're going to do what needs to be done whether you like it or not. Because that's part of the commitment. But we generally don't talk about these things before marriage. I get people to talk about these things a lot before they get married because I think it's critical that you understand what you're getting into and why you're getting into what your expectations are, which is why we go through the personality test so you can understand why people are the way they are. And I have you go through the love languages to know how to communicate with each other. I have you go through the expectations exercise so you kind of know what each other expects. And so that's, that's just a minimal amount of things you could be doing pre-marriage. Pre of course, the problem with all of you is that once you decide you want somebody, I can't show you enough to get you not to do it. You're going to marry them anyway. Okay? Because it's an emotion-driven thing at that point. 
the desire. I want him. I want her. Yeah, but it's not going to go well. How do you know? I don't know. I've only done this five million times, you know, counseling people. How do you know? I know. Okay. But you're going to do it anyway. <laughs> I've told people, this is, a, I've told people, some have listened, some have not, not necessarily here. And I've told them when they told me, well, you know, I, I've come into this walk and everything. And I've been doing this for a long time and I'm engaged. I said, is your girlfriend your, or your boyfriend, whatever, your fiance, are they in this walk? No. Don't do it. What do you mean don't do it? But I love him and I love her. And you're going to have a mess because you're dedicated to a walk and they're not. Well, that's not a negative on the one that's not dedicated. It just means two can't walk together unless they agree. That's an Amos, right? Okay? And so you got problems right there, I promise you. Because two walking in agreement's tough anyway. Because you don't always agree on everything, you agree on some things. But at least if you have the big thing, the vertical thing in agreement, the rest of it is much more fixable. It's easier to adjust. Okay, so just realize when I did say yes, the marriage is one of the best places to really work on being dedicated and committed to something. But don't start judging your spouse on this issue if you've been married for 20 or 30 years and you've already got what you got. Okay? Yes, unless you both want to talk about it and look each other in the eye and say, I want to recommit. I want to actually do this right. That would be great. I love doing renewals for vows. You know why? Because that person still wants to be married to you. And they know you. I love that. Of course, if I do the vow renewal, there is one rule. I don't want you ever coming to counsel telling me you want a divorce. You married the person you've known for 20 years again? I don't want to hear nothing. You knew what you were getting. Unless some bizarre thing you didn't know about all of a sudden pops up, which almost never happens. You know that person. You live with them for 20 years, you know them. Okay? Because <laughs> some people think it's, because you think it's a nice idea to renew your vows. Well, it's a nice idea. Don't do it unless you're actually renewing your commitment because you're deciding, I want to marry you again if I could do it today. I want to recommit. That's a whole different thing. And it's more powerful because you didn't even know each other. I don't care how well you thought you might have. You didn't really know each other until you got married. Because you really don't know anybody until you're married to them. Okay? You think you do, but you don't. Only to whatever level, right? But there's a limit to how much you can know them. But you've been married now 10, 20 years? You know them. You want to remarry them and recommit? All right. But don't you tell me anything. I don't want to hear any of that nonsense. You know what you got. Oh, but she does, he does. But They've been doing that already for 20 years. <laughs> so now it's a problem? Why did you recommit? Do you understand what I'm saying? All right. Shama Steve. All right. I, I, I'm glad that you covered this because I was looking for that. Now is the time to rededicate yourself teaching, and I, for some reason, was able to find it. Okay, time to rededicate yourself is only on the Potomatic oh, site. Oh, okay. It's okay, an that's audio that's only. I was right. actually intending to redo the teaching with this teaching, and decided instead to just do this Hanukkah thing about dedication. But I actually was going to redo that teaching and it turned into this. So. Uh, yeah, I, I'm glad because uh, we both and I, Beth and I, have been started uh, several months back on the uh, personal development, listening and looking. And so, so I'm glad that that's coming. You're going to talk about that later. But I wanted to touch because you talked about one of the things about being dedicated. I think tithing is something that I'm really dedicated to. We, I don't even add it in my account. I know how much is going in and how much is going out. I, I don't even see it as far as the dollars that in my written checkbook. So I don't even miss it. And I've been living off of 70% for the last seven years. And this is eight, I think, number eight. No, I'm in year one of the third time around or whatever yeah so so it's it's pretty good and i'll tell you what if you listen to rabbi and do what you're supposed to do i just went last month without even paying myself and all our bills that are paid in fact i was able to reposition some uh debt and stuff like that i'm debt free because i moved money and i didn't even get paid 
this month. But and then I was I knew because of the world has this holiday that a lot of things kind of go on hold. Now my January is doubled just by sitting and trying to be patient and talk to Abba. It's like, okay, what am I need to learn with this situation and with that situation? How can I try to be better? And I think I listened because of some of the things I've been hearing and just the speeches because they're like clicking. It's like, ooh, yeah, go. ooh, get my butt kicked here and get my good. <laughs> there. So good. It's, it's good because when you, get, when you know you got your behind kicked, then you're at the point where you're ready to maybe change because it's when you keep getting beat and you keep allowing it to repeat, that's when you haven't acknowledged that that's an area you I'm need made. to fix. I mean, isn't it, isn't it good to be in a congregation where A, you can get your butt kicked and B, you can say it from the microphone? I mean, because I know there was no congregation I ever went to could you do that. Which is sad because sometimes you got to say it. <laughs> All right, Grayson, and then we got to get to the live stream. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. So my question is, at what point does temple maintenance negligence become sinful? At what point does temple maintenance negligence? Well, um, it's not so much sinful, although there are things, depending on what you're neglecting, that could be sinful. In other words, it depends on what things you're neglecting. But just the idea of neglecting this and taking care of you and, and doing the things that we talked about here, they're going to lead you either to a point where you're going to get derailed or you're going to fall apart or you're going to atrophy, so to speak, and regress. And then you'll end up in some sort of sin. Okay, so just neglecting is what we would say. Foolishness is not a sin, but it leads to a lot of sin. It would be very foolish to do it. All right? All right, Marlene's going to sneak in and be the last one, and then we'll go to the live stream. See, I have these heels on, and so I wait for the line to die down. Okay. <laughs> because because standing, in, in, standing in them is a problem, but walking is okay. Yeah. Okay. See, you need, I'll let you try my Listen, shoes on. They're so on sparkly, I'm kind of <laughs> blinded by the sparkly. They're very sparkly. Okay. Okay. Shabbat shalom, Rabbi. <laughs> I'm so excited that we have service. I, I was thinking about looking at old, old, you know, and I was like, and then when I found out we had service, I was like, yay! But I was, I was late. I was one of those people, so I'm, I'm going to do better. I just want to thank you, Rabbi, for chastising me last night because it, I thought that I had disabled the being chastised by Rabbi in public button, but... <laughs> <laughs> If you figure out how to do that, teach some of them because they, they need to know how to do that. <laughs> My button was not disabled. And I, and I thought I was proud of myself. I was like, I've disabled that button. You know, I was talking to the elder another time and I was like, oh yeah, psh, you know, I disabled that button. And then the button got pressed and I was like, crap, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I just want to thank you because, you know, I know that it's the father bringing ugly stuff up. Like you said, the darkness has to come up so that the light and, and get out so the light can come in, you know. So, you know, I just, I just, I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful. And I know, you know, people have a problem with whatever, the directness and all that, but we need that, man. You know, we got to toughen up. You know, and if we're going to make it, <laughs> we, we're not going to be wusses. You know, we're not going to be wusses. Right. We're going to have to go through some stuff. So thank you, Rabbi. I appreciate you. I appreciate that. And thank you for showing that this is also the ministry where you can say wusses. Okay, so. Because you know me, there are no bad words. Okay, so listen, listen. Um, and I, just to set you straight on, on, so those who were not here, we had a little thing going on, and Marlene did something that wasn't in itself wrong, but she didn't have the right protocol of asking permission, whatever, and so I corrected that. But it's, it's one you want to know. Correction in public happens when what you do is in public. That's why it happens, okay? And I know a lot of you are like, oh, no, you should take someone off in the private. Not necessarily, because everybody needed to know that that was a wrong protocol, Okay. And so, by the way, if you're doing something that's a wrong protocol, even if it's a permissible thing to do that I'll say yes to, you still need to ask, okay? And you probably would have got a yes if you had asked, but you didn't ask, and that's why I said you got to ask next time, okay? And so that's just one of those, because at some point, look, if you were going to, 
meet the king. I was going to say the queen, but now she's dead, so it's the king, right? So if you're going to go meet the king in, the, in England, all right? Do you know, or you're going to go meet the president here even. Do you know there are people that will take you first and make sure you know the right protocols to do? How you approach, where you stand, whether you shake hands or not, or what, they'll tell you what the expectation is in terms of processes and protocols. I'm trying to prepare you to understand that there are right processes and protocols, or to at least be aware that most things do have them, and if you don't know what they are, you might want to ask and make sure. Don't just assume in our very sort of self-whatever that we could just do whatever we want to do because it should be allowed to do. Some of you, you know, look, I'll give you an example. Some of you will be late Friday night, or even on Saturday, but especially Friday night, and bang on that door. And I'll tell you what, I don't care if it's zero degrees outside, I'm gonna tell anybody near that door to leave it locked. That door is open, you know that door is open, and that's where you're supposed to go. Because once we start, we close this one. But you'll come up and start banging. I'm not having anybody open that door for you. You can walk a few feet around the building to the one you should know is open. This is a process we've had for a very long time. But I got people getting up and I said, stop that. But someone's banging on the door. So what? They know the other door is open or just point the finger that way and they know they should go around to the other door. There's a sign on it that says go to the other door. Okay? And they should know that. And so, but you have to know, oh, but you think, oh, but it's me or my friends or my husband or my wife is in there, whatever, or it's a kid. No, you go to the other door. If it's 6.30 and we start, at 6 o'clock when we're starting the service, 6 o'clock that door stays shut. If you're late, that's okay. Come in the other door. Look, I was raised in a Jewish synagogue protocol where when certain things were happening in the synagogue itself, you, if you were out in the hallway, you couldn't get in. You had to wait till they finished whatever part of the service they were doing before you could walk in if you were late. Even if you went, maybe there's a part that was more interactive. You can, sometimes you can get up and get out and you went to the bathroom and then you got to come back. Well, if they're doing whatever they're doing, like before the rabbi's sermon... You couldn't get up and leave or come in during the rabbi's sermon. That was one of the protocols. Now, when the rabbi wasn't a good rabbi, a lot of people tried to have excuses to leave right before he started, and they're like, oh, well, I couldn't get back in. But it's protocols, it's processes. You guys should understand that, all right? And so we're going to learn how to do this, how to walk this, how to be this. Don't take it wrong. Get that button fixed like Marlene's talking about, all right? Because correction should be welcome. Some people got corrected last night for various things. Hopefully they handled it well. Happens every day. Every day people get corrected for various things. Hopefully they handle it well. Handle it well means own it, fix it, move on. I can promise you one thing. I don't even think about it after it happens. Elder could tell you that. It happened, I forgot about it. I've got people who come and talk to me at a feast who I haven't talked to since the last feast and say, I really just wanted to apologize. And I have no idea what they're apologizing for. Okay? Seriously, they'll, they'll say, or he'll tell me, this person just wants to apologize. I'm like, for what? <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know what they're apologizing for. And then they'll tell me, and I'm like, really? That? From when? I mean, I didn't even remember that. I hold nothing, okay? I hold no grudges. I hold no anything. I get you in your face at that moment, because I want, I, when you say, man, you were upset about it. No, I wanted you to realize that was something that needs to not happen again. And then I forget about it. It's over. And if you know me, you know that's true. Okay? Anyway. All right, live stream for the last 15 minutes. <laughs> we only got one question, Rabbi. There you go. All right, from a Cody, it says, um, why didn't we keep the light in the menorah for eight days instead of create, or create a tradition of a Hanukkah? Was there a Hanukkah in the temple during the time of Messiah's earthly ministry? Okay. You need to understand. That's a good question. Well, you got to understand that the idea of a menorah all right? Menorah is simply a candlestick. And that's why we're talking, that we're told about the seven-branched menorah that was in the temple. So you can have three branches, five branches, you can have anything as a candlestick for various reasons, because you happen to like to light that many candles for whatever reason. Because this is an eight-day thing, and because of the idea of the Shamash candle, they made a menorah to do this function. It's not disrespecting the seven branch one. The seven branch one has a purpose, okay? And so just when you see this one has nine in it, 
There are others that have three, others have two, others have five. I mean, they can make any kind of thing with any kind of amount of candles on it for whatever purposes and decoration that you may want to do. Okay, so it's not like this holy symbol of some sort. The one that was special was the seven branch one that was made out of one piece. Imagine that, right? And it was in the temple. And that one was set apart for that purpose, right? Okay. All right, so that's going to conclude.